This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the second video for Unit 15. In this video I want to talk briefly about fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base balance in the human body. We've been talking about homeostasis all along as we go through this course. And so getting to fluid balance and electrolyte balance and pH balance are all looking more specifically at some particular components of homeostasis. I also want to remind you that our body is driven by various metabolic reactions and these reactions take place in solution. So fluid balance is extremely important so that these reactions have some place to happen. Fluid is also part of our joints in the uh, synovial fluid and the other places where we have lubrication, the cerebral spinal fluid where our brain is floating. Um, there are a lot of other places where we need to keep fluid in the correct proportion in order to maintain an effective and healthy uh, body. You also have already learned about some of the hormone-based mechanisms that are involved in these various balances. And so I'll just be reminding you in this video of the things that we've already talked about. The pH of body fluids is carefully controlled by a threefold system. So we're going to be talking about three different ways that acid-base balance is um, maintained. We'll be talking about the various chemical buffers, how our respiratory rate is involved in maintaining proper pH, and then of course back to our kidneys. So let's start by talking about where fluid is found in your body. Body fluids are constantly shifting between three different compartments, and so this diagram gives you a, a graphic of that. One compartment is the intracellular fluid, the fluid that is inside the cells. Another compartment is the interstitial fluid, the fluid that's outside of the cell between other cells, kind of filling in the cracks. And then the third section is the plasma volume, or the fluid that is inside the bloodstream. The extracellular fluid, then, is the fluid in these two compartments, and sometimes extracellular fluid is even more broken down, but um, I just want you to think about being fluid, fluid being found in these three various areas, intracellular and then interstitial and plasma, plasma and interstitial making up extracellular fluid volume, and all of it of course is taking up about 60 percent of your body weight. Men have a little bit more of their body as water weight than women because a greater amount of fat tissue in women decreases the percentage of body weight. You know oil and water does not mix, so adipose tissue does kind of uh, those Tissues where, where there's a high level of adipose tissue, there's a slightly lower level of water. Children tend to be slightly higher in the amount of water per body weight, and the elderly are lower. So this general 60% of body weight is just sort of a mid-range value. The different, these three different compartments, body fluids are constantly shifting in between the different compartments, and so things are very fluid just inside there. It's not a static situation. And the two driving forces for how fluid moves around your body, you have heard about before, so let me just remind you, it's hydrostatic pressure. That is the pressure of the water, like water in a hose or a water pipe pushing out. And the osmolality, or the um, pulling in that happens because of the solutes that are dissolved in water or in fluids. So just to put that in a graphic form, we see that we've got the hydrostatic pressure here pushing fluid from the bloodstream out into the interstitial fluid. And then you have some um, the osmolality, the, the colloid pressure from the solutes pulling interstitial fluid back in. Um, hydrostatic pressure also pushes fluid into the lymph capillaries as we've talked about how they have a little sort of uh, flapping door with how the cells are aligned. In when between the, the interstitial fluid and cells themselves, uh, the pressure tends to be more in equilibrium. That's why your nutrients can be exchanged between the cells that need the nutrients and the interstitial fluid that's holding it. Transcellular fluid is a comp another uh, part of extracellular fluid this is the stuff that's found in the cerebral spinal fluid system um, inside your joints. It's where fluid is found in your body that's um, not inside a cell, but it's inside some sort of epithelial lined compartment. This chart gives you an idea about some of the composition of body fluids. We can see down here sodium is highest 
in the interstitial fluid and the plasma, so that's in the extracellular fluid. Chlorine tends to, chloride ion tends to just follow sodium, so wherever you find sodium, you tend to find chloride. The other anion, the positive ion that is important with sodium is potassium. They tend to work in opposite directions. So potassium is found mainly inside the cells, intracellular fluid. The bicarbonate ion we'll be talking about with a buffer system, and as you see, it is found outside of the cells in the interstitial fluid and in the plasma, and it has a very important role in maintaining pH as does this phosphate ion, or biphosphate ion, and its role, very similar to the bicarbonate, but it works inside the cell. And then some other key electrolytes that we'll talk about later, calcium, magnesium, and various proteins are found in different components around the, the, in the different body fluids. So over the course of a day, your water intake and your water output, what you excrete, will balance out. And it's roughly 2 liters. This diagram is saying 2.5 liters or 2,500 milliliters. But it's, it's in balance. Um, if you are in good health, what you take in will then be balanced by what you are putting out. You get water from several different places. Of course, the bulk of your water is going to come from whatever beverage you are taking. Uh, water, fruit juice, milk, um, soda, coffee, caffeine-containing beverages are may have a slight diuretic effect, but they generally are very, very high in water, and so they're, we're not particularly concerned about the uh, caffeine causing a diuretic effect. Alcohol, though, is, is definitely a diuretic, and it doesn't get counted as a beverage because it ends up you lose more water from alcohol than you actually gain from drinking it. Even solid foods will provide some water because there is a, a bit of moisture in most foods that we eat. And then, of course, our metabolism, we make water by some of the chemical processes that go on inside our body. But the bulk of our water intake is going to come from beverages. How does the water go out? Well, there are some ways that we can't really measure it very easily. Water is lost through feces and through sweat. And as we exhale, there's moisture in the air that's coming from our lungs. And so these are all um, amounts of water that's lost that we really can't measure. If someone needs to measure your water loss, they'll be measuring your urine because that is something that we can measure. And as you notice from this chart, it is the bulk of where the water output is, is coming from. So how does our body control our water intake? Since that's where water you know, is coming in, how do we make sure we get enough in? Well, our body has osmoreceptors that are located in the, uh, near the, the hypothalamus in the brain. And so they are keeping track of how concentrated or how dilute the cerebral spinal fluid is. So that that is the cerebral spinal fluid. As I said, fluid is constantly being interchanged between the different compartments. So uh, dehydration in one compartment will lead to dehydration in all compartments. And so when the osmotic pressure increases because there is less water, more solutes, more osmolality then, um, the thirst center will be activated by these osmoreceptor sensor receptors. And so that causes us to feel thirsty and hopefully to seek out something to drink. By drinking, we're putting something in our stomach. The stomach is descended, it distended, it is made larger. And so then there are stretch receptors that will provide feedback to the thirst center in your brain saying, you know, water has been taken in, it's, it's okay now. And so then you'll stop drinking. The water, of course, is absorbed very quickly through the walls of the stomach and through the small intestine. And so then they move, the, that fluid then moves into the bloodstream and it's secreted into the interstitial fluid and into cells that need it. And eventually you end up with your extracellular fluid levels returning to normal. And so that our water intake is regulated by our thirst and, whether, and being uh, driven to seek out some water because we are thirsty. How about water output? Then how do we regulate water output? Well, the way we handle the other half of the balance is through the kidneys. The osmoreceptors, again, sample the cerebral spinal fluid. And if we are suffering from dehydration and increased osmolarity, we our body will release antidiuretic hormone. ADH is released from the posterior pituitary and it goes to work on the kidneys. 
ADH, as you remember, um, will cause the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron and the collecting ducts of the nephron to become more water permeable, and that means that more water will be reabsorbed out of the urine back into the bloodstream because the person is in the state of dehydration. And so then the excess water intake decreases the osmolarity values, which then would, as a negative feedback situation, decrease ADH. And so we control our water output through the use of the antidiuretic hormone, which allows more water to be reabsorbed when we need to have more water in the system because we are dehydrated. So that pretty much covers fluid balance. Let's go on to electrolytes. Well, electrolytes, of course, are ions that can transmit electricity. And we've talked a little bit about the, the potentials in the nervous system and in the muscle systems, and those are really electrical impulses. So we need these ions available to have this a little bit of electricity happen in our cells. Some of the key electrolytes are sodium and potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, sulfate, which is a polyatomic ion, and phosphate, another polyatomic ion, bicarbonate that we'll hear about in the buffer system, and of course hydrogen, which too much will make us more acidic than we need to be. We get our electrolytes primarily from foods. It doesn't usually uh, end up being a problem. It's uh, just people are not necessary are not easily deficient in electrolytes if you're eating enough food but a severe severe deficiency might cause a particular craving if you've been in a situation where you've sweat a lot you may experience a salt craving that you have lost sodium through your sweat there's also a situation called pica or pica um, that often uh, people have cravings to eat things that are not food um, and such as dirt or plaster or paint. Um, and this is something some people f s propose that some types of pica may be caused by a deficiency in a particular mineral. But there are other things involved in, in this particular behavior, so it can't be directly related to nutrients. So the body does lose a few electrolytes by perspiring. I just talked about salt. We lose some in the feces because we're not 100% effective in reabsorbing things in the small intestine. So are we have mechanisms to make sure the most important ions are um, controlled, are regulated. And so, again, we've talked about some of these in talking about the endocrine system, how sodium and potassium and calcium in particular are controlled by our body. So I just want to look at those three ions as an example of the kind of the, the way that the body deals with electrolytes. These particular ions are vital for nerve impulse, we already talked about that, for muscle fibers, and also for maintaining the cell membrane permeability or, or semi-permeability. So kidneys, again, are very much involved in this. Of course, you know, we've been emphasizing through this whole unit on the urinary system on how things are absorbed and re or are filtered and then reabsorbed in the nephron and how that's um, such a key part of homeostasis. So just kind of using these two graphics to go over this. It, sodium and potassium are very closely related. I did mention there's the sodium-potassium pump that works in your cell membrane. It keeps on moving sodium out of the cells and potassium into the cells so that when you, with nerve cells, when you need to have a nerve impulse go through, the ion channels open and the sodium just rushes in by diffusion. Thinking back, way back to last semester, we talked about that and how that whenever there's a concentration gradient, movement of ions will happen much faster than if you have a, some kind of carrier protein or something to move things across the cell membrane. So the sodium-potassium pump is always pumping sodium out of the um, cells and pumping potassium in. But if the balance gets off, if, if the blood level of sodium falls, there's not enough sodium being pumped out, and you know there's blood level potassium rises, so there's too much potassium left outside, it's not being pumped in, then the hormone aldosterone is triggered to be released. It is one of the hormones that comes from the adrenal cortex, remember back in, in the endocrine unit, and the aldosterone targets the kidneys. Of course, it's, since it's a hormone, it travels through the bloodstream to get there, even though it's just sort of next door. But the uh, aldosterone works to have sodium reabsorbed by the kidneys in the 
proximal convoluted tubule. And because of that, then you have a higher level of sodium available, and the um, potassium and sodium pump then normalizes things so that your blood sodium potassium levels go back to where they need to be for proper body homeostasis. And so that the potassium and sodium, we, we talk about sodium being what's controlled by aldosterone, but since sodium and potassium are connected together so much with movement in and out of across the cell membrane, um, blood levels of potassium as well as uh, blood levels of sodium are involved in triggering aldosterone. Another hormone that we talked about was the parathyroid hormones. We have a little picture here of a thyroid with the parathyroid glands attached to the backside. And parathyroid hormone is released when there is low blood calcium, hypocalcemia. And so it acts in several places. It acts on bones for the osteoclast to uh, break down the bone and release calcium and phosphorus into the bloodstream. And parathyroid hormone acts on the intestine to increase calcium absorption from food. But it also acts on the kidney. It causes the kidney, kidney to promote the activation of vitamin D, which of course is needed to absorb that calcium from food. And it increases calcium reabsorption again in the nephrons, in the convoluted tubules. And so the end result is that the calcium levels in the bloodstream rises, and then, of course, is a negative feedback system that shuts off your parathyroid hormone. So that just highlights these two or three, actually three very important anions, positively charged ions, that are controlled by hormones through a negative feedback system. When levels are too low, the hormones kick in, cause something to happen, and then that would turn off as the blood levels rise. And then finally, moving on to acid-base balance. Just to remind you that some substances, some electrolytes, when they become ions, they cause a release of hydrogen. And so if hydrogen is released, this substance becomes known as an acid. And other ones are able to pick up that hydrogen ion, and so a substance that can accept a hydrogen ion is a base. So the acid-base balance is involved in regulating the number of hydrogen ions that are out in the various body fluid compartments because slight changes in hydrogen ion concentration will change the pH and pH changes can affect your enzymes, uh, twist them into a slightly different shape so they don't work or cause other um, positively charged ions to uh, collect in places where they shouldn't or not to collect in places where they should because there's too many hydrogen ions that are taking up space or just get in the way of other processes, again, by um, basically you know, attaching to a molecule where it shouldn't. We have a very close regulation of pH in the body. Um, only being able to tolerate uh, kind of in maximum extreme levels of 6.8 to about 8.0, but you really don't want to be on either one of those ends. You are quite sick if you are that acidic or um, alkaline. For an example, our blood pH is staying very tightly controlled between 7.35 and 7.45. So there's a very tight control over acid base because the, having things have a, having a body become too acid or too basic, too alkaline, really has many, many repercussions. Where do we get hydrogen ions then? Where do they come from? Well, uh, we've talked about when we were talking about the uh, respiratory system and picking up car or, or picking up carbon dioxide from the cells. Remember when carbon dioxide goes into the red blood cells, it combines automatically with water and makes carbonic acid. And so that's one source of hydrogen ion. Um, we talked about lactic acid as an end result of anaerobic respiration of glucose. We mentioned that s substances other than glucose can be broken down to give energy. So if fatty acids are broken down to provide energy, you can end up with ketone bodies, which can um, also add uh, hydrogen ions. They are acidic. And then the amino acids, like the, um, they contain carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, like your carbohydrates and your fats, but your amino acids, your proteins are also often containing sulfur, and so these can lead to sulfuric acid being produced as those particular amino acids are broken down, and there are other proteins that contain phosphorus, 
as well as nucleic acids as being a good source of phosphorus, and so there's phosphoric acid. And so these are some of the ways that we get acid into our body, into our internal environment. Um, I think you can see from this is that there's a fairly high tendency for metabolic processes to lead to the body becoming more acidic, not more basic, and so the, the uh, various systems in our body are really designed to get the acid out. We're not as concerned about having too much of an alkaline statement because we're really, we really tend to become more acid by all the various um, parts of metabolism. So the normal metabolic rea reactions tend to make us more acid. The cellular metabolism of glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids contribute to this, and so there are three ways that we try to deal with that excess hydrogen. There are the buffer systems, the chemical buffer systems, and then the respiratory system can kick in and help get rid of some acid. And then, of course, our kidneys then are the third line of defense. The chemical buffer systems are basically three. You have the bicarbonate system, the phosphate system, and then the protein system. And I'll start here on the bottom. The protein system we've already talked about when we talked about the bloodstream. I mentioned that hemoglobin can buffer the excess hydrogen that is released when carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid and then immediately breaks down into the bicarbonate ion. So that's what's going on up here in the bicarbonate system, showing that carbonic acid, which forms naturally when carbon dioxide um, interacts with water, but if it gives up, it's a weak acid, and if it gives up its hydrogen, we get the bicarbonate ion. The bicarbonate ion can attract an, a hydrogen and become carbonic acid, and so it can serve to grab any excess hydrogens that are around. If you have a bicarbonate ion available, it picks up extra hydrogen and turns into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. It doesn't really like to break down that much. It's not like hydrochloric acid, which immediately dissociates into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. But carbonic acid, some of it just sits in this uh, full form, doesn't ionize, and so it does not act as an acid if it doesn't give up that hydrogen. So that the hemoglobin, getting back to our proteins, hemoglobin is a very important protein. It's, this is a key buffer for hydrogen in the blood because it grabs that extra hydrogen that is released by the carbon dioxide making carbonic acid. And then the bicarbonate ion is left available to pick up any other hydrogens that might be coming around because of metabolism. There are some other proteins involved in buffering acid base, but the hemoglobin is really the biggest one, and that's the one I want you to remember. So the hemoglobin protein and the bicarbonate protein, are, or bicarbonate ion, are involved in buffering the blood. The phosphate system is very important for buffering inside of cells, and it works similar to the bicarbonate. So you see that we've got two different forms of a ion molecule that are based on phosphate. We have biphosphate and dihydrogen phosphate. And so one will convert a strong acid to a weak acid, and a weak acid is one that doesn't ionize, so that hydrogen will not go into solution. And the other one can convert a strong base into a weak base, which again will not ionize and cause a change in pH. And so inside the cells, we've got the phosphate system buffering things. The second line of defense is changing your respiratory rate. If the chemical buffer system is not sufficient to deal with the change in pH, then you will have an increase or a decrease in respiration. There are several conditions that can cause metabolic acidosis. As I said, we, our, our metabolism naturally tends to make things more acid inside the body, but disease states such as diabetes will um, make that even stronger and can cause metabolic acidosis. Aspirin overdose, which um, is, aspirin is not being used quite so much as it used to for uh, uh, medical purposes, and so that's not quite uh, the problem that it used to be. But it, it can cause acidosis, as can chronic diarrhea, which um, you're constantly then throwing away, letting, you know, putting out through di the diarrhea, the emptying of the di intestinal system, the um, bicarbonate ion that, that is part of what's being produced by the pancreas, and so that ends up sending the balance over to the acid side. Metabolic alkalosis is not as common. It's very, very rare, 
but it can be caused by an overdose of antacids or chronic vomiting. Again, this would be putting out acid that the body, I mean, the hydrochloric acid in your stomach is calculated into the overall acid base balance. And so if you are suffering from chron chronic vomiting, you're not um, able to keep the hydrochloric acid inside your body, you're just throwing it out. And so that can slide your pH towards the other way, towards more alkaline or higher pH system. You can also have respiratory acidosis or alkalosis that is induced by changing your own breathing rate or your breathing rate changing because of other circumstances so that if you are in a, experiencing a panic attack and you are hyperventilating um, or when I was having children in labor, towards the end stages of labor, I tended to hyperventilate. And this would put you into alkalosis. So um, this is a, an induced metabolic uh, change because of an increased, or a, you could go the other way, a decreased respiratory rate. This chart shows that, so that the normal pH of the blood will be influenced. I mentioned hyperventilation, which was then causing me to lose CO2. I was breathing it out too fast, and that would lead to, if it went on too long, it would lead on to alkalosis, an increased pH, the body becoming more alkaline. And so the natural response of the body was to cause that to you know, hy hypoventilate, to slow down in breathing, which would then lead to, by decreasing the, um, the breathing out of carbon dioxide, then it would then reset the body back to a normal pH. The other way this works is that if there's some factor causing hypoventilation so that there is an increased um, conservation of CO2, more carbon dioxide is kept in the bloodstream because it is not being exhaled out, then that carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid and we have a decreased pH or acidosis that will trigger then hyperventilation and increased breathing rate, which will then reset things back to normal. And so these are, again, things that are happening because your hypothalamus is sending uh, regulatory information down to your medulla and your pons where your respiratory center is, and then those autonomic nervous system are sending the nerve impulses down to your diaphragm and your respiratory system. This particular buffering, or not buffering, but the respiratory regulation of pH is, again, on the autonomic system side. You can voluntarily um, hyperventilate, often connected to anxiety situations, but the response that I'm talking about here is something that's going to happen automatically through your autonomic nervous system. And finally, your kidneys are also involved in balancing the acid base of your body, the, the pH of your body, the acid base balance, because hydrogen ions can be secreted. They can be sent into the urine from the interstitial fluid, reabsorbed and taken into the nephron and then taken out of the body. If you are taking in a lot of protein or you are burning amino acids because there's not enough carbohydrates available to provide the glucose for energy, then you can have a buildup of hydrogen ions. And so then they can move back in. You can see this arrow right here, hydrogen going in through the proximal convoluted tubule or also over here it being secreted back in through the collecting duct so that once hydrogen adds, is put into the, inside the tubule of the nephron, then that, of course, is where urine is made and it's on its way out of the body. These three systems have a different uh, response rate. Your chemical buffers are the fastest. They respond essentially immediately to normalize the pH. If a hydrogen ion you know, enters the blood, then there's going to be a bicarbonate ion that's going to snatch it up right away. And there are many, many excess bicarbonate ions. But if by chance, for whatever reason, what, going, what is going on in someone's body, their chemical buffers are not sufficient to um, equal out, equalize the pH and keep the acid base in balance, then the respiratory rate will kick in. This is the second line of defense. And it may respond uh, to make a change in the pH over a course of minutes to hours, so it is a slightly slower. And it is not as effective as chemical buffers, but it can be, uh, you know, a, can compensate for things and may be enough. If it is not enough, then the kidneys come in. So this, again, is going to involve the um, various hormones and 
processes that we don't talk about in this course. And so it does take hours or possibly even a whole day or more to start working and to affect the acid-base status of the body, but it is a highly effective system. And so we've got three levels of responses, and hopefully if you are experiencing a situation where your acid base is kind of going out of whack and, and your pH is rising or falling where it shouldn't be, then um, with all these things working together, you'll be restored within a couple days back to a more balanced system. So that's what I wanted to cover for this unit on fluid electrolyte and acid base balance, just giving you a flavor for some of the ways that homeostasis is maintained for these three very important components of your body.